Hi. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story entitled Gender Binary and LGBTI People, Myth and Medical Malpractice. And the myth is the gender binary, as exemplified in the Adam and Eve story, with the implicit notions that there's only two sexes, and sex and gender are the same thing, and there is only heterosexual attraction. I contend that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people have been and continue to be victims of medical malpractice purely because they are neither Adams nor Eves. And what I'm going to do is summarize for you what scientists have learned about sexual development, uh, especially in the brain, over the last 50 plus years. And then I'm going to tell you what the medical community has been doing and what they're still doing. Physiologists call the mechanism of sexual development in mammals the organization activation mechanism. And as we well know, our genitalia are organized before we are born. First under the influence of genes and then hormonal influence, the important variable being whether testosterone is present or absent during critical periods of development. So we know we come into the world with genitalia that are already shaped. But we also know these genitalia are not mature and they're not working yet. That happens with activation hormones from the gonads at puberty uh, cause them to function. So that's the organization activation mechanism. On the right, we have the female if, uh, development. If the sperm that fertilizes the egg has an X chromosome, we get a genetic female, XX, and the gonad will automatically become an ovary. Now in the female, the ovary does not have to produce hormones before birth. We get a typical female, the internal genitalia, external genitalia, and the brains, we will see, develop uh, as they do in a typical female without any hormonal support. And the ovaries only put out significant hormones uh, starting at puberty with activation. In the male, if the sperm uh, has a Y chromosome, we get a genetic male, XY, and there's a special gene on that Y chromosome called the SRY gene that codes for a protein that makes that gonad become a testes. So notice that the male has a special gene on the Y chromosome necessary for making a testes. And then the testes must secrete hormones in order to get a typical male. One hormone is gonna stifle the development of the female internal genitalia. And the testosterone is necessary to support the development of the male internal genitalia. And as we shall see, the male brain. And in the external genitalia, an enzyme will convert the testosterone to dihydrotestosterone which will masculinize the genitalia. So notice that the male has to make a hormone to stifle femaleness and has to make another hormone to support maleness. We all start out the same way, internally and externally, in the indifferent stage. Where we're, uh, we start out internally as hermaphrodites with the beginning of both the female system and the male system. Uh, now in the female, the male system, remember, automatically withers away, no hormone required. And the female system develops automatically, no hormone required. In the male, one hormone causes the female system to wither away, and the testosterone causes the male system to develop. The external genitalia, we start out with only one set of. Uh, and then we uh, either go the female or male direction, uh, uh, or something else, as I will show you. By the seventh to eighth week, we, uh, the male and female start to look different because by this time, the testes have formed and they're secreting testosterone. And so what would become the labia minora in the female would become the underside of the penile shaft, and what becomes the labia majora in the female become, uh, becomes the scrotum in the male. By the twelfth week, this story is over. However the genitals look, that's the way they're going to look when you're born. Now in order for that testosterone to work, it has to get into the target cell and it has to bind to a receptor. Think of the hormone as a little three-dimensional key. The receptor is like a lock. The, fee, the key has to fit in the lock. And when it does, we get an active transcription factor that will bind to the DNA in that target cell and cause certain genes to be expressed. Dihydrotestosterone does the same thing and this is how we get maleness. So folks, males are altered females. Everybody is a variation on the female theme. Females default, males are fully altered females, and it follows that if hormones have dose-dependent effects, we should have some people around who are partly altered, and that would give us a type of intersex. Yeah, intersex people are a physical refutation of the gender binary. 
because they differ physically from standard males or females. Many kinds of intersex people, some of them have ambiguous genitalia. I'm going to uh, uh, tell you about a couple of them. And intersex people demonstrate that the organization activation mechanism works in people just the same way as it does in all other mammals. So one kind of intersex condition is called androgen insensitivity syndrome. Is this person a female? Well, in every cell of her body, there's a Y chromosome. And she's got testes, not ovaries. And the testes are pumping out testosterone, a lot of it. But the testosterone doesn't work because, see, we're here we're looking at a map of that receptor, the gene for that uh, testosterone receptor, the lock. And all these lines are pointing to places in the gene where we have found mutations in humans. Uh, and if the mutation is such that the lock changes shape so the key can't fit in it, then the testosterone and dihydrotestosterone cannot work. And that's what happened here. This is complete androgen insensitivity. So this is a genetic male, a gonadal male, but it looks like a female. And uh, that's what you get when that lock doesn't work at all. What if the lock works partly? Then the testosterone will give you a partial effect, and you'll get somebody looking like two or three or four or five. If you're three or four, that's really ambiguous genitalia, and we can't tell whether you're a male or a female. Like a mirrored condition uh, is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the classical type, because these are genetic females now who have been exposed to testosterone during development. They carry genes that have mutated so that an enzyme causes a lot of uh, androgens to be made by the adrenal cortex. And so, and so they're born not looking like typical females. They can have a very large clitoris, like one or two or three or four or even five that externally makes them look just like a male, although internally they have female organs and this urethra is hooking up to a uterus rather than a prostate. So folks, it's very clear that we're born with our genitalia, we don't learn them and we don't choose them. But what about sexual behavior? Do we learn our sexual identity? Do we choose our sexual orientation? I'm going to give you four lines of evidence that show that the organization activation mechanism works in the brain the same way it does in the genitalia in people like it does in all other animals. And these four lines of evidence are the animal work, the David Reimer story, sexuality of intersex people, and human brain work where we're comparing trans and gay brains to the brains of Adams and Eves. The animal work. In 1959, the first paper showing the biological origins of, of uh, sexual behavior where they described uh, treating female guinea pigs with testosterone during the later stage of pregnancy. This is after the genitalia have formed. And upon puberty activation, these guinea pigs, uh, although they were female, uh, had sexual behavior that was very male-like. So this showed that the testosterone was organizing the brain and the behavior was affected later in life. And many, many, many mammals have been looked at over the years since then, and all of the evidence points to a determining influence of prenatal hormones uh, when it comes to sexual behavior, without exception. And something else we know from the animal work is this part of the brain here, called the hypothalamus, that's hooked up to the pituitary, which it controls, and it's also hooked up to the ancient emotional mammal brain, the limbic system. We know the hypothalamus is the place for instinctive drives and behaviors. When you're hungry, when you're thirsty, when you're sleepy, that's your hypothalamus talking to you. It's in charge of you. You are not in charge of it. And it's also in charge of sexual function. It's important to know that this limbic system, one component of which is the amygdala, the source of all your emotions and emotional expression, and this hypothalamus that are hooked up to each other, these are ancient places in the brain, similar in all mammals. We also know from the animal work that it's this front part of the hypothalamus in blue. This is a rat and that's a you. It doesn't matter because it's always the anterior hypothalamus that controls sexual behavior. We can show this if we lesion this area, we destroy the sexual behavior in both sexes. If we stimulate it with hormone implants, we get that sexual behavior. If we look at this part of the brain under the microscope, we see sexually dimorphic nuclei. That is different size nuclei between males and females suggesting this area of the brain has something to do with sexuality. In order to tell you about David Reimer and the intersex people, I have to introduce these two adversaries, John Money and Milton Diamond. John Money, he's the bad guy. He was a psychologist. 
He's a, he was a psychologist who formulated the psychosexual neutrality at birth theory. He maintained that we learn our sexuality. And this theory, we come into the world with a sexually blank brain, okay? We learn our sexual identity, we learn our sexual orientation, and this evolved into the optimal gender of rearing policy uh, that uh, uh, required that you uh, make sure that the genitalia look conventional so that the patient and the parents don't get confused about what their gender is supposed to be. And if you have altered the genitalia, you have to lie to this person because that would spoil their, their optimal gender rearing. Uh, now, Milton Diamond was a biologist. In fact, he was a graduate student in that University of Kansas lab that published that first paper in 1959. So he has an evolutionary view, uh, paid a lot of attention to the animal work. He wrote a great paper challenging money's theory way back in 65 when Milton Diamond was just a grad student, but nobody paid attention to it because he was just a grad student. And John Money was already a big shot at Johns Hopkins. David Reimer was John Money's most famous patient, and uh, this case was known as the John Joan case in the medical literature. David Reimer was an identical twin boy whose penis was uh, destroyed in a circumcision accident. The distraught parents consulted John Money, who says, well, we'll make him a girl. So they castrated this little baby. They surgically uh, altered him to look female, raised this kid as a girl, lied to him, told him he was born a girl, and uh, John Money announced to the world that this was a great success, that this kid was growing up as a well-adjusted, happy girl and becoming a well-adjusted, happy woman. And uh, you can see uh, here is uh, David as a little girl, Brenda. And at the age, this kid was miserable. Though. John Money was telling the world that the kid was a happy girl, but he wasn't. He was miserable, made a lousy girl. And at the age of 14, without knowing he'd been lied to, without knowing he was born a boy, he decided to live in the world as a male. At this point, the father broke down and told him the truth. And for the first time, David Reimer understood who he was. And here you see him debuting as a male. He had surgery, he took hormones. He really tried hard to reclaim his life and live it according to his uh, sensibility. He even married a woman with children. Oh, uh, I have to go back and say, uh, so what happened? John Money kept telling everybody that this was a big success, and when uh, David Reimer started living in the world as a man, John Money claimed to lose track of him. How convenient. <laughs> Aha, but fortunately, Milton Diamond found David Reimer, found him in the mid-90s living as a man, and David Reimer had no idea that his case was a famous medical case. He had no idea that this case had become the model for standard care for babies with ambiguous genitalia or baby boys born with a micropenis or baby boys who had their penis destroyed. He had no idea that thousands and thousands, we have no idea really how many, thousands of intersex babies all over the world had their genitalia mutilated, were lied to, and raised in a gender that didn't feel right for who they are. When David Reimer understood that all these intersex people were suffering, he decided to cooperate with Milton Diamond and he uh, came forward and told his story. And this was the beginning of the end for John Money and his bogus theory. However, John Money's theory took hold in the 50s and, pre and prevailed through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and through most of the 90s, and his legacy lives on, as I will uh, show you. Uh, this phalometer, was uh, designed by an intersex group to show how John Money's theory played out in medical practice. So, if you were a baby boy, your penis could never be too big, but it certainly could be too small. And if it was smaller than an inch, well, we're just gonna hack it off and raise you as a girl, okay? And a clitoris can never be too small, but it certainly can be too big, and if it's too big, we're hacking it off with its nerve endings, and uh, that'll make you an Eve, you see? You gotta be an Adam or an Eve. You gotta be able to penetrate or be penetrated. You never can be something in between or both or neither. Now, ever since uh, John Money was exposed as a quack, many of the intersex people have been coming forward out of the shadows, out of the secrecy and shame. And now we can learn about their sexuality. So what about these people with complete androgen insensitivity uh, syndrome? What is their sexual identity? Guess what? All of them feel female because the testosterone could not work in their brains. Okay? And how about the people with partial androgen insensitivity? Well, some feel like males and some feel like females. It varies. 
So many raised as boys live as uh, females as they get older. Many raised as girls live as, as men as they get older. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, most of these uh, uh, females are heterosexual women, but the incidence of bisexuality and lesbianism is higher, and that goes along with the organization activation mechanism. And then there's a group of intersex people. This is called cloacal extrophy. This condition uh, causes malformation of the entire pelvic region, and usually the genitalia are poorly formed, if at all. Uh, half of these babies are genetic males, XY, and the testes have produced testosterone normally before birth, but because of John Money's policy, these people uh, were sub, uh, subjected to feminizing genital plasty. Of course, they were castrated and uh, lied to and raised as girls and told they were born girls, and guess what we know now? Many, many of these people, as they grow up, uh, start living in the world as men without knowing that they've been lied to. So clearly, something very powerful and something very innate is going on here, and it has nothing to do with their upbringing. And finally, the brain work, where we compare the brains of trans and gay people with the brains of Adams and Eves. OK, and if you got your hands on a bunch of transsexual brains, where would you look to compare them? Why? The animal work says, look at the anterior hypothalamus. So that's where they looked. And guess what they found? They found this nucleus, it's a pair actually, called the bed nuclei of the stria terminalis. Now this is a region where the emotional brain, the amygdala, is sending in emotional information to the anterior hypothalamus, the sexual brain. And uh, we know if you destroy this area, there is no sexual behavior. And this is a typical straight man. This is a typical straight woman. This is a gay guy to show that this region has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Gay men and straight men look the same here. But this, this is a male to female transsexual. And I want you to notice how similar this region looks to that of a typical female. These scientists incorporated controls to show that the size of this uh, nucleus is not influenced by sex hormones in adulthood. The inference being that these brain regions were organized before birth. Now that was a study looking at the presynaptic nerve endings coming into the nucleus. A second study looked at the postsynaptic uh, cells and found the same kinds of results. Straight man, straight woman, gay man, male to female, transsexual. In this study, we also have the first and only uh, female to male brain. And when we look at this nucleus in that individual, there it is with all the other typical men. And here's somebody who was male-bodied but felt female ever since uh, you could remember, but never did anything about it. No surgery, no, homo no hormones. And now when we look at this part of the brain in that person, it looks the same as in regular females and in the trans women. Now, I think this uh, tells us that trans uh, people are not crazy. And they're not imagining or, or making anything up that what they say about how they feel about themselves is real, okay? And plus, we have genetic evidence. Uh, there's a high proportion of a male to females who carry a gene that uh, codes for a longer version of the androgen receptor, which is known to weaken the testosterone effect, and this could explain uh, why the brain did not uh, uh, get altered to give them a male identity. And there's also a high proportion of female to male people who carry uh, <coughs> genes that code for enzymes that cause a lot of sex uh, steroids to be made before birth, and this could masculinize the brain and cause them to have a male identity. How about sexual orientation? Well, now we know gay people are all over the world and that homosexuality is widespread in the animal kingdom. And again, uh, you get a hold of a bunch of uh, gay brains like Simon LeVay did back in 91, and he looked at the anterior hypothalamus, of course, and we find that only this one pair of nuclei there, the third interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus, are uh, very different between gay, gay men and straight men. Straight men have a much bigger nucleus, and gay men have a size nucleus similar to that of regular females. And a second study done on human brains confirmed the first study. And moreover, uh, when scientists looked at rams who were known to be exclusively gay and compared them to the straight rams and looked at this 
these nuclei in the anterior hypothalamus, what do you think they found? They found the same thing that we found in the human studies. And functionally, we know the anterior hypothalamus lights up for same-sex pheromones in gay people and opposite-sex pheromones in straight people. And we know uh, that there is a genetic component in both gayness and lesbianism. Uh, and so, this wordy slide is filled with quotations <laughs> from the scientific experts in the field. I didn't want to change what they had to say. Gender identity and sexual orientation are programmed or organized into our brain structures when we are still in the womb. Since sexual differentiation, this next uh, uh, statement addresses the origins of transsexuality. Since sexual differentiation of the genitals takes place in the first two months of pregnancy and sexual differentiation of the brain starts in the second half of pregnancy, these two processes can be influenced independently, which may result in extreme cases in transsexuality. So notice it's not that they mislearned their gender roles or something went wrong when they were being raised as little kids. This is an innate uh, phenomenon. And now the next statement is the scientist talking to the pediatricians and telling them to stop the infant uh, genital mutilation. This also means that in the event of ambiguous sex at birth, the degree of masculinization of the genitals may not reflect the degree of masculinization of the brain. So don't think you can guess what the sexual identity of this kid is going to be by looking at the genitalia. You're going to have to let this child grow up and they will tell you who they are. And finally, a humdinger sentence. There is no indication that social environment after birth has an effect on gender identity or sexual orientation. So, you know what? We don't learn our sexual identity and we don't learn our sexual orientation. We discover it. So what has the medical community been doing to LGBTI people? Well, they've pathologized and stigmatized us from the get-go. And their policy has been to fix LGBTI people, make them conform to the gender binary. And I'm sure you know, gay people have had all sorts of atrocities visited upon them. They've been castrated. They've been administered sex hormones. They've been psychoanalyzed. They've been negatively conditioned to homoerotic stimuli. They've had their hypothalamus lesioned. They've been submitted to electroshock treatment and epileptic insults, and none of these things have worked. That's a very uh, impressive uh, kind of evidence right there. And homosexuality has been classified as crazy since the inception of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of Mental Illnesses, which is the Bible of the American Psychiatric Association. And gay people, we got ourselves removed from the DSM through political activism. There never was any science in this story. The psychiatrists never had a shred of evidence to show that gay people are crazy. And yet, the reparative therapy continues in spite of the fact that we know that it doesn't work and that it causes harm. And this quote here, saying that they're even using shock treatment still, is from an article in a newspaper from this month. The anti-trans quackery continues too. In the DSM, uh, trans people are crazy. They have gender identity disorder. And the World Health Organization, as well as the American Psychiatric Association, considers trans people crazy. And not only that, but they have given the revision of the DSM over to rep reparative therapy quacks. Uh, and uh, uh, they are changing the name to uh, placate uh, uh, trans activists. But Trans people are still crazy in the DSM. What about intersex people? What is the medical community doing to them? Guess what? They're still mutilating the genitalia of intersex babies. Whatever happened to medical ethics? Whatever happened to informed consent? Whatever happened to first do no harm? And speaking of harm, now that uh, money has been exposed, there have been a few follow-up studies uh, these are males, half-raised female, half-raised male, and down at the lower table is uh, all genetic males raised as girls, and that's a 2012 paper from Germany. And just look at those numbers, they're horrible. In spite of all the surgeries, these people hate their bodies, they're having all kinds of problems, two-thirds with sexual dysfunction. This word here means uh, painful sex. Uh, you know, doctors with scores like these, you never would have gotten into medical school. And these very researchers never asked what if we had done nothing? What if we left the genitalia alone with the nerve endings intact and everything working? And uh, Milton Diamond went to the uh, American Pediatric uh, 
conference in 2000, he said, listen, you've got to declare a moratorium on these genital normalization surgeries until you can prove that you're doing something good. And they said, no, no, we're not declaring a moratorium. And they used parental distress and prejudice to justify the ongoing damaging surgery. And not only that, the pediatricians actually voted to not inform their former patients of their intersex status and previous medical treatments. And in response to intersex activism, they devised new pathologizing terminology so that all intersex people are disordered. And to boot, those quacks that are revising the DSM have invented a new form of craziness for intersex people who are unhappy with the gender assigned to them at birth. It's very clear that we need to reform medical care for LGBTI people. The scientific message that core sexuality is innate needs to reach everybody. LGBTI people are natural variations. Yeah, we're different, but we're not disordered. And the medical people should have as their goal our health and happiness, not trying to convert us into Adams or E's. Clearly, ethical guidelines for medical treatment of LGBTI people should be established because medical policy should be based on scientific evidence and ethical principles, not religious myth. gene on the Y chromosome necessary for making a testes. And then the testes must secrete hormones in order to get a typical male. One hormone is going to stifle the development of the female internal genitalia. And the testosterone is necessary to support the development of the male internal genitalia. And as we shall see, the male brain. And in the external genitalia, an enzyme will convert the testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which will masculinize the genitalia. So notice that the male has to make a hormone to stifle femaleness and has to make another hormone to support maleness. We all start out the same way, internally and externally, in the indifferent stage where we're, uh, we start out internally as hermaphrodites with the beginning of both the last 50 plus years. And then I'm going to tell you what the medical community has been doing and what they're still doing. Physiologists call the mechanism of sexual development in mammals the organization activation mechanism. And as we well know, our genitalia are organized before we are born. First under the influence of genes and then hormonal influence, the important variable being whether testosterone is present or absent during critical periods of development. So we know we come into the world with genitalia that are already shaped. But we also know these genitalia are not mature and they're not working yet. That happens with activation hormones from the gonads at puberty uh, cause them to function. So that's the organization activation mechanism. On the right, we have the female if, uh, development. If the sperm that fertilizes the egg has an X chromosome, we get a genetic female, XX, and the gonad will automatically become an ovary. Now in the female, the ovary does not have to produce hormones before birth. We get a typical female, the internal genitalia, external genitalia, and the brain, as we will see, develop uh, as they do in a typical female without any hormonal support. And the ovaries only put out significant hormone uh, starting at puberty with activation. In the male, if the sperm uh, has a Y chromosome, we get a genetic male, XY, and there's a special gene on that Y chromosome called the SRY gene that codes for a protein that makes that gonad become a testis. So notice that the male has a special the female system and the male system. Uh, now in the female, the male system, remember, automatically withers away, no hormone required. And the female system develops automatically, no hormone required. In the male, one hormone causes the female system to wither away, and the testosterone causes the male system to develop. The external genitalia, we start out with only one set of. Uh, and then we uh, either go the female or male direction uh, or something else, as I will show you. By the seventh to eighth week, we, uh, the male and female start to look different because by this time, the testes are formed and they're secreting testosterone. And so what would become the labia minor in the <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story entitled Gender Binary and LGBTI People, Myth and Medical Malpractice. And the myth is the gender binary, as exemplified in the Adam and Eve story. 
with the implicit notions that there's only two sexes and sex and gender are the same thing and there is only heterosexual attraction. I contend that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people have been and continue to be victims of medical malpractice purely because they are neither Adams nor Eves. And what I'm going to do is summarize for you what scientists have learned about sexual development, uh, especially in the brain, over the last